Well, if you got a Bible, would you open it up uh, to Hebrews chapter 13? Hebrews chapter 13. I want to set up where the message is going uh, with one verse here, one sentence from the book of Hebrews. It's verse 3, remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners. Now, that sentence or that phrase gets quoted often. It's the second part that I know for me, I've kind of missed, uh, just haven't drawn as much attention to it. Here's the second part. And those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. So last Sunday, being Pentecost Sunday, we talked about raising the sails of our life and catching the Pentecost wind of the Spirit. And as we raise our sails and as we catch the wind, we talked about how it it moves in this direction of God's heart for anyone and everyone. That at Calvary, Jesus shed his blood for anyone and everyone, and at Pentecost, he poured out his Spirit for anyone and everyone. And I want you to think about then, that means as a follower of Jesus, if we are going in the direction of Christ with our life, if we've given our hearts to Him, if we have His Spirit living within us, then there has to be a contact point with what the Scriptures call the mistreated, the overlooked, the marginalized, the often forgotten. And this is like, I think the Bible reveals that God's heart is like in a disproportionate measure, His eye is turned towards those who are often overlooked, mistreated, marginalized, forgotten. And so for, as followers of Jesus, this is a key part of our formation, which also helps us understand like as a church, why we've been engaged for so many years with the brokenness and lostness of the world around us. Like, why have we been trying to end child sex trafficking for so many years around here? Because that's God's heart, right? To engage with ending that atrocity of human trafficking. To engage on the near west side here and do something about the cycle of poverty. To join Ali King and Clyde Bodkin and Danny Marquez and and roll up our sleeves and, and help in any way that we can help there. To drop off food here. To help those in need with food and physical needs like that. What's all that about? It's aligning our heart with God's disproportionate heart, attention, and care for what Hebrews 13.3 says, those who are mistreated, as if it was we ourselves who were suffering in that way. And so, in light of the events going on in our world and the continued upheaval happening and the cry for justice and the cry for peace and the cry for where is our hope in the midst, in the midst of the racial tensions and the racial injustice in our land. In the midst of all of that, I decided this week to completely shift what we had previously planned for the message this morning. I just felt like a leading from the Lord. I just thought it was the right thing to do. Talk to some of the t- uh, staff team here about it. And we were of one spirit that it was time for what I'm calling a candid and necessary, albeit imperfect, conversation. So let me say this as I set up this conversation. I know that I'm not going to say everything correctly. I I, I know that. Uh, As a white person, as someone who's trying to speak into issues, that's a huge learning curve for listening and learning and understanding. I know I'm not going to say everything right every time, and I just want to say on the front end, I apologize uh, if I don't say it right. But here's what I'm not going to let it do, my commitment to you as a church. I'm not going to let my concern for saying something incorrectly to keep me from saying something at all. It's been too long. I've been silent and quiet for too long. I thought I got it. (laughs) I didn't get it. (laughs) I thought I got it. I I have wonderful friends in the African-American community. I have great relationships. I spend a lot of time, do a lot of ministry with uh, with people in the black community. I'm so grateful for their heritage and their culture. I thought I got it, (laughs) but I didn't get it. And so my commitment to you and to our church family is I join in raising my voice and our voice 
albeit maybe incorrectly at times. But we can't be quiet. God's heart for the mistreated and the overlooked, the theological foundation for this conversation that we're going to have this morning about race and justice and hope, the theological foundation is the heart of God. This is God's heart for all people. And in our own land and in our own country, there is a large section of the population that is Hebrews 13, 3, have been mistreated. And it's time for it to stop. And we've got a part to play. I have a part to play. So, this interview recorded on Friday night. Pastor Jesse Bingham, Our Hope Community Church. Jesse and I have known each other for 13 years. We formed a friendship through the Colts organization. Jesse's t- daytime job is he's a, a banker for Huntington Bank, uh, and he has the branch office there at the Colts Complex. And for 13 years, uh, Jesse and I have soul talks about ministry, and, but his full-time job is he's a full-time pastor on the near southeast side where he grew up. And he's been doing great work for a lot of years. And I just thought, and it's time for Jesse and I to sit down. So Friday night, uh, Ben Newsom, our tech director, and I, we went down. And uh, we sat in Jesse's uh, sanctuary. And we had a conversation, honest and open. And uh, Jesse Bingham and your family, if you're listening or watching this at some point, thank you so much for your willingness to open up your heart and your life in this way to us. So Eagle family, before we push play on this interview, let's say a couple more things. I'd like you right now to set aside your phones, whatever other distractions. If you're like got breakfast preparations going, all that, could you just wrap up the breakfast preparations right now? Maybe even set aside the plate of food and open up your heart. I want you to ask two questions. God, what are you saying? And God, what are you seeing? God, what are you saying? And what are you seeing? And kids and students, I believe this is equally important for you as it is for the adults gathering around. So kids and students, I think this is one morning. Perhaps parents, if you feel like uh, they're able to push pause on whatever their kids' programming stuff is, I think This is an equally important conversation to have as a whole family. And Jesse and I tried to approach the dialogue with the whole family in mind. So following the interview, I'll come up, have some kind of closing thoughts, and talk about some next steps in this. But without further ado, here is a conversation with Pastor Jesse Bingham. Pastor Bingham. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for having us here. Honored, my brother. Our Hope Community Church. Honored. Here Honored. on the near southeast side. Yes. And we've known each other for 13 years. Yes, we have. And I've enjoyed our talks, and you've been on my heart, brother. And Thank I know you. these last two weeks have been, I mean, just would love for you to unpack a little bit the images as they scrolled across all our phones, you know, when George Floyd's arrest and all that happened and then his eventual passing and yes um, just thought about yes. when you first saw that Jesse when you first saw that talk about help us understand what was going going on inside of you you know when I first saw that I was uh, I was very angry really very angry because I was like uh, you know, here we go again you know it's 2020 and you know, this is still where we're at uh, here today. I was uh, very angry. I was, I was appalled. Uh, I was f- offended. I felt disrespected. I felt uh, discriminated against. Uh, I felt that um, uh, what's been shown time and time again over over years of oppression that uh, uh, some people in society think that a black man's worth is 
zero, that he doesn't have any mm. value. Mm. Uh, I didn't say feel that particular way about myself because I know who I am and I'm comfortable in my, who I am, but just society's view of us. I was very angry, uh, Pastor. I um, was angry about a whole lot of things on a whole lot of different levels. Yeah, talk about where your anger was directed towards because I think that might help us understand like the layers to it. And, 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 that, and that's a good way to put it because it was many layers. Um, definitely uh, with a police officer and how he was just so callous having his hand in his pocket, you know, just sitting in there casual and cavalier, you know, like he was Captain Morgan or something, you know, and uh, just putting pressure on uh, Brother Floyd's neck, and then you got the other officers just standing around. Uh, I know some of them, some other videos that came out showed some of the officers trying to do crowd control, but it really bothered me, too, that they stood around and didn't do anything. Mm. Uh, and as other videos have surfaced, you know, um, uh, two minutes and 47 seconds uh, left on the taping. Uh, the man didn't even have a pulse, but he still stayed there on his neck. That he was already dead. That was callous. It was like, you know, wouldn't it have been a beautiful narrative if one of the police officers that were standing there witnessing would have just arrested him right there? Mm. Arrested that officer right there? Mm. That bothered me. Another thing that bothered me was that, uh, uh, that day I had to role play again with my loving, beautiful 19-year-old son on how to react and conduct itself during a traffic stop all over again. So I mean, wait, this so is- Wait a minute, Jess. So you're saying you've, you've done this before? Absolutely. With your 19-year-old son? Yes, you had I have. The conversation reset. What's that? How does that conversation go? You know, he, you know he's a- Typical kid, loving, but you know he was uh, uh, reluctant to do it. Didn't want to do it. I said, "Well, you're just gonna have to entertain me because I need to make sure that you still remember mm -hmm. how to do it." And we we role played. You know, I was the cop. You know, he was the driver. You know, what do you do when they pull you over? What did you do when uh, they ask you to pull out your license? And and he was right on point. You know, play by play. What do you do if they ask you to get out of the car? We told him how his body, how to, uh, how his body language should be, uh, how he should uh, look him in the eye, and how he should be, uh, yes sir, uh, no sir. Uh, you know, don't roll your eyes, don't smirk at him, even if they talking crazy to you. But I told him I don't never want you to give them any reason uh, to cause you any harm. Mm. I said I want you to act like I'm telling you act so that you can come home. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, I'm going to mess his quote up, but he, I saw uh, a part of a quote that he said today, he talked about uh, racism is like dust. Uh, it's, it's always been there, but until you shine a light on it, you that's mm -hmm. when you see it. Uh, you can sit, be there sitting there choking on it and, or whatever, but it's there. And this is another thing too, Pastor Egg, why I think that it's so hard to, um, to close the door on this situation. Uh, because there's a whole lot of generational hurt. Hmm. Help us understand that. A lot of generational hurt. Uh, um, um, Emmett Till. He was born in 1941. He was a 14, for those that don't know, he was a 14-year-old black kid who was, 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 was beaten beyond recognition uh, uh, by uh, uh, some Caucasians for uh, supposedly uh, disrespecting a white woman in her family store. He was beaten so bad they couldn't even recognize him and they wanted to have a closed casket, of course, but his mother said no. She wanted the world to see what they did to her son. Mm. What white, some white society don't understand is that these tears that we're crying, this hurt that we're feeling, this pain that's just eating us up like a cancer, but especially these tears that we are crying, they're not just for George Floyd. Mm. They're for Kunta Kinte. Mm. They're for Megger Evers. They're for Emmett Till. They're for the four little girls that were bombed, that were, gotten, were bombed at the, that church in Birmingham. This is for uh, 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 Philando uh, Castile. 
Come on, these, these for Breonna Taylor, for Michael Taylor. The, 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 these tears, man, you know, these tears are for Rodney King, Dr. King, and Michael Taylor. I was just talking to my family about this case. He was a young kid that I was familiar with his family. They lived on the south side, went to Manuel on Draper Street, not far from him here. Uh, I think it was maybe 30 years ago, if I'm not uh, correct, about 30 years ago, he was arrested. Hmm. They put him back in this, this IPD. They arrested him, put him in the back of the police car. Handcuffed, Michael ends up dead. The police say, the world says, the city says that Michael shot himself in the head. This is why I have, you know, this, 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 is, this is how deep racism goes for me, uh, man of God. They say they, he shot himself in the head. Well, how do you explain that? Black people, we want to know. We, we, we black people, we want to know how did he shoot himself in the head? Their excuse was there was a, a gun wedged down in the seat that another suspect must have left mm. with his hands behind his back. And he's cuffed? Cuffed, shot himself in the head. Mm. Systemic racism. Mm. They, I remember them bringing on TV contortionists. That's a slap in the face. Contortionists to show how this kid shot himself in the head. And, 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 and when we go off about that, when we riot, when we protest, uh, when we loot, uh, when we don't go with the status quo and just bow down and humble down and be still and shut up and don't bring it up, mm. we're rebellious. See, see th th this thing about us being rebellious, uh, 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 you know, uh, white society really expects uh, black people to really uh, to cower to them like they did way back then. So when we don't act the way they want us to act or when we buck or don't go along with status quo, we're considered rebellious. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was in school, I was probably a, um, a junior at the time at Manuel High School. My brother was a senior. We had English class together. And my teacher, English teacher, his name was Mr. Snotty. I know we probably don't want to say names, but he, <laughs> he, we need to expose things, don't we? Okay. Mr. Snotty, uh, we had an essay to do. And uh, uh, we had turned him in, you know, the grades that came back. Mm -hmm. Came in the class, passed everybody's out. Skipped over me. See, I didn't sit in the back row as a kid because I, I just didn't. I didn't know he was, I was in, the, in a game, you know, mm. this game of life. I just always kind of sat in the front, second row or first row. That was just me because I couldn't, wasn't nothing, you know what's going on in the back of the class. So um, uh, he skipped over me. Yeah, uh, you didn't give me my paperback, Mrs. Nye. Well, you know what? You didn't write it. What you talking about? You heard me. You didn't write it. Busted me out in front of the whole class. Was it embarrassing? No, because I was cool and comfortable in who I was and stuff. Didn't embarrass. I'm like, man, what are you talking about? I did write. No, you didn't. Woo, 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 this, woo, woo, that. And, and, and God, I, I, I'm, I'm glad that uh, I, I look back now and I'm glad that my brother wasn't there. He was older than me and a very protective of me because that would have probably turned out ugly. <laughs> Yeah, I bet. And, and I don't know if he threw me out the class because of our back and forth or I walked out, but I went down the office. Uh, Mr. Root was the principal, and, I, and everybody, a lot of people couldn't stand Mr. Root, but Mr. Root was my guy. I worked in the office and stuff, and they were like, what, what are you doing down here just out of the class? I said, I need to call my daddy. White America, that's what we call, black folks call our daddy, dads, we call them daddies, okay? <laughs> it's a difference, amen. I called my daddy. My daddy, March, got to the school, I mean, like lickety split, and he came and brought the noise. And I was like, man, what's your, I said, so you, you telling me, you, you think that I'm not smart enough to do this? You think because I'm a, a, a black athlete that I'm not capable of doing this? Was this too good for you? And he sat there and ate crow. Mm -hmm. Racism. And, I, and I'm glad that I had some, some, some strong parents and some strong support that I didn't go left. And then one more I share with you, if it's okay. Yeah, please. I uh, in the uh, '90s I was uh, uh, I was playing basketball for IUPY, 
and uh, going to school there, of course, uh, working at Harry Levinson's Men's Store in Washington Square Mall, my first job ever. And I remember uh, um, coming from work one day, and um, there was a, a Circle K gas station that's right on the corner of 30th and Midhofer. I went there to probably get some gas or something, and I can't remember what bill that I gave the guy. And as a matter of fact, uh, to come to find out later, it was a, a, a off-duty cop, maybe Moonlight, or just doing a second job. Him and a, a girl there, but the, the, the guy, the cop, he was at the register. Not no uniform, and like I said, I found out that he, he was. He might have even told me he was in the, when he was in the store. But uh, when I paid him, he didn't give me my correct change back. I mean, I can count. I'm educated. And my father always told me, if you can't count nothing, be able to count money. And so I was like, I didn't get all my, my money back. I said, hey, man, you didn't give me all my change back. Yeah, I did. I said, no, you did. Yeah, I did. I said, man, no, you didn't. I gave you whatever it was, a 10 or 20, whatever. And we had a back and forth. And I was like, man, just forget you, because I saw I wasn't going to win. Next day, very next day, sweetheart remembers this. Next day, she's smiling, white smiling. Uh... I'm coming out of Kavanaugh Hall at IUPUI, IUPUI's campus. She's coming, I think, out of the lecture hall. My girl, she was my girlfriend then, but she's my queen and my wife now. I see her on campus. I'm like, what is she doing here? She's on campus looking for me because my mother had called her because the police was at my house looking for a box cutter and some clothes that I had supposedly wore and came back to that gas station to cut the female attendant up. Wow. Yes, I, I, I used to have a, a horrible disposition for police. Mm. But it has to stop somewhere, and that is not going to stop until we unite and, and, and until uh, 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 non blacks, especially Caucasian, speak up about this injustice and equality and police reform. And a lot of people want justice, uh, uh, but they, uh, they, they let uh, uh, the quest for justice uh, overrule the fact that this man is dead. And yeah, I want justice too, uh, man of God, but there wouldn't be no, no need for justice to be executed in this situation if the police officer didn't commit a crime. Yeah. And let him know that I know all cops ain't bad, and I'm and I'm glad to have a a, a greater uh, a, a, a greater heart for them now, uh, because all cops ain't bad. We have to stop broad stroking. Right. Yes. I thought about the the text we exchanged when I first reached out to you. Um, you replied. Do you remember your reply was? Yes, sir. You're the first non-black person hmm. to reach out to me. Yeah. And man, I just, my heart was hurting on that. I could, I could tell that it was through, like, your, how, through your response. How can that be? God. How can that be? And when I think about um, many conversations I've been having over the last couple of weeks with my mainly white relationships, and like you, I'm not claiming to speak for all white people, but I think we have to have the conversation about. Yes, sir, my brother. But the tension is, like Jesse, I think we as white people, we want to say something. We want to speak up, but we don't know what to say. Yes. And we feel like we might say the wrong thing. Yeah. We, we don't want to add hurt on the hurt. Yeah. Um, we don't want to get labeled as you just don't know what to say and yeah. everything's getting edited today and everybody's accused and, yeah. you know, of not saying the correct thing. And yes, so there's sir. this thing inside. I wonder if you could just help the listeners today, like, well, what would you want to say to, to folks who, who feel a burden, who, who feel they, they want to say, I see, I hear, I care, uh, but I don't know what to say? Well, I, uh, first of all, thank you for reaching out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do have to say that this was all God uh, because some of these people... Uh, you may not even have their numbers, and, but this was all God. But but uh, right. me speaking that in the atmosphere and what you did, it uh, uh, set off uh, mm. some great events of some phone calls from some of my non-black brothers. Amen. Again, like I said earlier, God knows what you need when you need it. Um, uh,
to ask you a question, but what, what I will say uh, to those that uh, don't know what to say, uh, don't feel bad that you don't know what to say. Because some of our brothers and sisters, black brothers and sisters, they don't even know what to say. And they're hurting their pain and their anguish and their disgust. So that is very, very understandable. Uh, also, um, uh, don't feel um, ashamed that you can't understand the black experience and, and what I'm going through as a black man or how my queen is, what she's going through as a black woman. Because you'll never be able to understand that yeah. since you're not black. Yeah. Like we can't understand uh, 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 being white. Yeah. We just can't. But if you can't understand uh, exactly what we're going through as African Americans, you can still understand our pain as human beings. Yeah. You can you understand hurt, you understand loss, mm. you understand some sort of struggle, uh, you understand uh, hardship to some degree, you you you, uh, you you understand job loss, you understand death, uh, uh, and the biggest thing that you understand uh, is right and wrong. Uh, so we want you to speak out, speak out better than silence right now, right? Because, uh, uh, uh silence is deafening. Silence is, 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 is deafening. It really is. And like you, I, I, I said, you, uh, uh, set some events off. God knows what we need. And, yeah. and then he said that he supply all of our needs. Mm -hmm. So as you sit here today, pastor, I, I want to kind of make this our last question, just yes, kind of sir. draw this to a close. I feel like we could have like, we need to have a part two conversation yeah, at some point, know, right? We could talk keep, all day. Keep, keep talking, but yes. I wanted to kind of end on the theme of hope. And I just, I feel like speaking some words of hope and dreaming a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I thought about your beautiful family. Thank so it'll be a picture, you know, of your beautiful family up on the screen right now. <laughs> and love for you to introduce them to everybody. So. Just introduce your beautiful wife and okay. your two kids. And right. It's my beautiful wife, my queen. That's Lachelle Bingham. My wife will be married for 30 years on June 30th. Uh, my daughter, my lovely daughter, who's my heart, she's the beat of my heart, Jashelle Bingham. And that's my son, that's my brother, that's my, that my man, uh, Jesse Bingham II. Amen. And how old are the kids? Uh, my daughter on uh, Sunday, she's going to be 25. And my son's 19. Amen. Yeah. That's great. I know you're a proud dad. I am. Proud I'm, husband. Lots yes, to be proud of. Yes. They, they bring, me a, bring me a whole lot of joy. It's my first ministry. Mm, they bring amen. me a, a lot of joy. So I'd love for you to speak to the hopes and dreams you have for your kids. And I know you long for them to experience something that's a different current reality. You know, yeah. that they'd be sitting around you know, 20 years from now, run the tape out and, mm -hmm. and dream a little bit about where your hope resting, right? Because you and I both believe in the, the power of Christ to yes. change a human heart. Yes, sir. Like we're giving our lives to that, yes. right? We believe that. Yes, sir. Yes, that, sir. That Jesus can yes. bring Hallelujah. a change. Jesus. And we know the change that we want to see externally yes. has to start. Internally. Right? Yeah. So maybe just speak a little bit to the hope that you have for the the reality you long to see your kids experience. You know, my, my hope for them, um, um, uh, one of my greatest hope for my kids is uh, that they don't allow this situation here, which easily could uh, tarnish their beautiful hearts. Because both of them have such beautiful hearts they're such good kids. They're preacher's kids and they really wear it well. Mm -hmm. I know they're not perfect, <laughs> but they're preacher kids, but they, 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 they wear it well. Uh, uh, they, they wear it the right way. Uh, they wear it with honor. Uh, but that's one of my greatest hopes for them is to not let the world or anything like this or anything uh, tarnish their hearts and change the type of people that they are. Mm -hmm. uh, both of them are so accepting uh, so loving of 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 everybody from uh, 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 from from race, uh, religion, socioeconomic status, or or or, or 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 sexual preference or identity. 
they're, they're, they're just so loving and I love that about them. And they're, they're both so intelligent. I learned so much from them. Uh, but my hope for them uh, is to be better uh, uh, men and a better my son to be a better man and my daughter to be a better woman mm -hmm. than me and her mom. Than, 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 than me and her mom are mm. because my wife is just just just, just wonderful. Uh, I may be the head of the house, but I ain't no dummy. I know who's the glue and holds it down. <laughs> I know who holds it together. But she is a a phenomenal woman. Uh, she's gifted. She's a strong, outspoken, uh, a, a, a black woman. She wears her her faith and her heart on her sleeve. And and my daughter and my, my son, they they take uh, uh, so many of their her wonderful traits uh, from her, and they live them out. Uh, my hope for them is to uh, is, is to always is to be loving, uh, uh, loving, uh, good citizens. That's one of my, my greatest hope for them is to be loving, good citizens. Is is to be uh, be for Jesse uh, to be a strong black man uh, uh, to don't accept. Uh, 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 no because of your color don't accept uh, to be discriminated matter of fact refuse to be discriminated uh, my daughter uh, bless her heart she's a double minority a black woman I, I, I want her to, to continue to grow and to, to be passionate I, grew, I want both of them to grow up to be, to be world changers uh, uh, to not take no's for an answer uh, uh, to, to, to know that if, if, if God shuts the door uh, he got a better one open. And if man shuts the door, that God can knock it down. You know, I want them to grow up, uh, to be hopeful and to grow up to, uh, 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 to teach my grandchildren and their grandchildren uh, 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 about, about righteousness and, and about the love of God. And that we're all created equal, even, that we're, even if we're not treated like it. And if we're not treated like it, don't stand for it. To speak up and to speak out. Uh, I, don't, I, I want them to, to grow, to, uh, to continue to, to never blend in, <laughs> to be their own people, to be their own persons. Because God, uh, he made us all in his image, but he gave us this great individuality. And, and, and all three of them, all four of us, possess it. But I want them to walk in, in their calling and not daddy's calling. That's the hope that I have for them. Amen. That's the, that's, that is the hope that I have for my children. Well, Pastor Bingham, what a blessing this whole conversation has oh, been. Man. What you didn't say. Blessing of your family. Yeah, uh, what a Pastor. gift it is that your kids have a dad like you. And your wife God. has a husband like you. And God be all the glory. That our Hope Community Church has a pastor like you. Man, to God be the glory, man. So I'm grateful this conversation has been, been rich. And yes. yes it needed. Is. Thank you for your transparency, your honesty, well, well, your willingness to... Welcome. Share some stories and to talk and to have some conversations and topics that, though difficult to talk about, necessary. I think we both yes. had the heart like, hey, these are necessary conversations to yes, have. They are. So, yes, any they are. closing word that you want to share before I'm going to ask you to close us in prayer? Okay. But uh, if there's any kind of a closing word that you want to leave with the group, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. Thank you. Uh, Eagle Church. You have a great man of God here. Great man of God here. Uh, I thank God uh, for your heart, man of God, and for your uh, compassion and even being bold enough um, to do something like this. I think it's needed. Uh, in my prayer, I've been praying that uh, we just don't change our hope in Eagle Church, but I pray that we don't even just change the city or the state but that this conversation would change the world. That's my prayer to God that I sealed in Jesus' name, and I believe that that's gonna do it. You said you got Eagle Church uh, campus in Hawaii. Yeah. Look at that reach yeah. right there. So I just thank God, and, uh, and I just want everybody uh, that views this uh, to continue to stand fast uh, in the Lord. Uh, stay on the wall. Don't come down. Continue to fight the good fight of faith. Because I believe that no matter what it looks like, I still know for a fact that Jesus Christ can change hearts. He can. He can open any door. He can shut any door. And then every door that he shut, no man can close. And every door that he closes, no man can shut. Yeah, amen. amen. Would you close us in prayer, brother? Absolutely. 
Father God, Lord, we thank you today, Lord, for allowing us this time, Lord. We thank you, Father God, for this purpose, Lord, that you blessed us with, Father God, that you even purposed before the foundation of this world. Lord, we pray, Father God, today that we honor you today, Father God, with our conversation. We thank you, Father God, for the honesty. We thank you, Father God, for letting us be candid. We thank you for even letting us get uncomfortable. Lord, I pray today, Father God, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, for all those that will witness this conversation will be moved by it. And that everybody that hears this conversation and listens to this taping, Lord, I pray that you will pour your spirit out on each and every one of us, Father God. I pray that you make us better men and women to make us better fit for service, to do the work that you specifically designed each and one of us to do individually and collectively. Lord, you are our strength. You are our redeemer. And Jesus, we just thank you, Lord, for your patience with us through all these years. We thank you, Father God, for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. And this is in your wonderful name, Jesus, we say and pray. Amen. 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 Brother. My brother. Oh, my friend. Love you, brother. I love you and I do call you friend. Call you friend. Call you friend.